So, you know, here in Lebanon, we have this mentality of the no pain, no gain. So you have to pull it, put it all out in one session. The problem is that we always uh, like cherish people who's going out all the time, like on all the sessions. And but I didn't I didn't know back in the time that what I was doing was wrong. But I understood that if they are doing that, so it must be working. So I must do it as well. I mean, I was used to the heart rate strap because I used to like the biofeedback, uh, like the heart rate and all of that. But I didn't know how to use the pa- parameters. I didn't know. I, I had the heart rate. I thought like in every run I would peak like at 170 heart rate. That was good. <laughs> this is what I thought. <laughs> but when I realized that I had to go, for example, for a, a, like below 135, I, I, I will tell you it was like going through hell the first six months I couldn't believe that even if I walk if I was walking like I was having a heart rate of 135 even for example if I go for a 30 minutes run I had to walk like for 25 and run for five minutes only (laughs) only. when I started math it was in the summer and I thought that it was was this my fitness level I couldn't believe that it was my fitness level Welcome to another episode of the Extra Miles Show. I'm your host, Flores German, and today I have a conversation with Wissam Kier. He is an inspiring endurance athlete from Lebanon. He has been part of my running coaching program, the Personal Best program, for several years now. And it has been inspiring to see his journey in training and racing over the years. Even recently over here at the Paris Marathon, he ran another personal best in a time of 2 hours and 44 minutes. Wissam used to train with a no pain, no gain mentality, really hammering out many high intensity miles. And when he discovered meth low heart rate training about five years ago, it changed his entire approach to training. He ended up training at a much lower intensity, having to slow down significantly on his runs, on his swims and on his bike rides. And that was challenging. That was frustrating. The fascinating part is, is that we some studied the mind for many years actually. He is a clinical psychologist, a physiotherapist and an assistant professor at the Lebanese American University in Beirut, Lebanon. Wissam shares his training journey and several of his lessons learned along the ways. He also shares advice for runners looking to become a stronger, healthier and happier athlete. This episode is brought to you by Path Projects. This is the only clothing that I wear every single day. I use it on all of my runs and also outside of running, for traveling, for being an active dad with my kids, and for work meetings. Path Projects makes shorts, pants, underwear, shirts, and headwear. It is the most comfortable gear, and that's why I replaced every item in my closet with Path Projects gear. Some of my favorite items are the Graves PX shorts in 7 inch with 4 pockets to store my gels, keys, my phone, and more. The Cascade t-shirt, I have 10 of these and that is what I wear every single day. And then also the Muir cap, and that is this cap that you see me wear very frequently. It has 94 laser cut holes in it. It keeps the sun and sweat out of my eyes and it doesn't overheat my hat. This is also the cap that my wife Jennifer wears frequently. For a limited time only, you can get 10% off your order of Path Projects gear at pathprojects.com slash flow. That is P-A-T-H projects.com slash F-L-O. See also the link in my description. This episode is also brought to you by Element, which is a delicious electrolyte drink that has everything you need and nothing that you don't. That means plenty of salt, potassium and magnesium and no sugar. Increasing my electrolyte intake has made a significant difference in my energy levels, in my quality of sleep and no more brain fog or headaches. It really can make that much of a difference. I typically start my day with drinking a large glass of water of about 500 milliliter, that's half a liter and I mix in one package of element. It helps rehydrate and allows me to maintain my focus and physical performance. And I actually really like that packaging. You can decide how much water you want to put in and that's how salty it actually becomes. And you will notice 
can make it quite salty or you can dilute it, but it tastes delicious. Go to drinkelementy.com slash flow to get a free sample pack of eight flavors with your first box. That is drinkelementy.com slash flow, F-L-O. See also the link in the description. Hope you enjoy my conversation with Wiesam. We some excited that you're here on the Extra Mile Show, finally, after several years that we have been talking. Thank you for having uh, me, Floris. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, for sure. Glad, glad you're here. How was your morning run? I see you're running so much, like every time that I check in on Strava, like we some has completed another 10 or 20 mile run. How was your run today? It was good. Actually, I was tapering for tomorrow's run. <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go that's good it's it's fascinating because when i look on average now i always see you somewhere at the top of the leaderboard in the different groups that we share and you're usually or at least the last few months i've seen you at 100 mile plus pretty exactly. consistently over there yeah. so definitely want to hear more about your running journey and the, the, the things that you've been up to lately, but maybe we can step back for a little bit just so people have an understanding of where it all started. How did you first get into running? What what got you excited to start running and how were those early stages? Like so yeah, exactly. I started back in 2017, 2018. I was like, I wasn't a regular runner, but uh, I was doing basketball back in the time in my teenage and youth. And then I shifted to running in 2017, but I started with, you know, here in Lebanon, we have this mentality of the no pain, no gain. So you have to pull it, put it all out in one session. Uh, and the, the, the problem is that we always uh, like cherish people who's going out all the time, like on all the sessions. And I didn't, I didn't know back in the time that what I was doing was wrong. But I understood that if they are doing that, so it must be working. So I must do it as well. Uh, and then I started like experimenting and searching and all of that. And uh, Eureka, I just found a video on YouTube. It was you, <laughs> actually, on YouTube. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the thing is that you were running uh, very like graciously, holding the cam, talking, and running a pace of 420 per, per K. So I asked myself, you know, how he is doing that and very easily without even like trying to catch his breath. So I, I, I said to myself, I want to do that. <laughs> and I actually read more about you and I got in contact with you and I started the journey with math. And I there will you tell go. you the struggle with math. So if you want to ask it, go Absolutely. Let's dive into it. So what, what year was that eventually it was, that it was, you started? It, it was in 2019, actually. Ni 2019. 19, yes. So like four, like five years ago, four years ago. Yeah, now I know. Like we've we've been talking for several years now. So So tell me a little bit more about some of those challenges because going especially in your culture it is really that that culture of no pain no gain and going from there to an approach of slowing down significantly in most of your training runs tell me what was that like how were those early stages for you i mean i was used to the heart rate strap because i used to like the biofeedback uh, like the heart rate and all of that, but I didn't know how to use the uh, parameters. I didn't, I, I had the heart rate. I thought like in every run I would peak like at 170 heart rate, that was good. <laughs> this is what I thought. <laughs> but when I realized that I had to go, for example, for a, a, like below 135, I, I, I will tell you, it was like going through hell. Uh, and it was it was actually my experience because if the first six months I couldn't believe that even if I walk if I was walking like I was have a, having a heart rate of 135 and I didn't believe in what we call the cardiac drifting also because I I, I didn't I didn't know that th this is I mean basic biology even if you dehydrate for example your blood will get thicker and once your gut will get thick get thicker your heart will have to deal with the pumping much much and more blood into your muscles so it will get like tired so i was struggling a lot like i was even for example if i go for a 30 minutes run i had to walk like for 25 and run for five minutes only <laughs> only so 
so yeah this this was in the first six months and actually for for i mean like anecdotally um uh, when i started math it was in the summer and i thought that it was was this my fitness level i couldn't believe that it was my fitness level because i, I thought it will take me a lot of time <laughs> and i'm old <laughs> yeah. yeah so so what what is your current age or what, I mean, what was the age that you started out I, I thought i started at 37 38 now i'm 42 and yeah. uh and yeah actually i had to go for like below 140 between 130 and 140 at the start uh, and coming from a very tiring training programs and training sessions, I had to deal with that. I had, I had to, even I realized that I had to let my body recover and like go slowly. So I started from scratch. Like I was, I used to, for example, while sta- before I started running, I used to walk for like 10, for 15 minutes just to give myself this leeway and give my, 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 my body this chance just to adapt. And then I would start running. The, the thing is that with time and consistency and doing that, I'm doing that actually every day. I, I didn't skip like one day of running since my beginning. Like, uh, so actually I used to do that very consistently. And uh, this, w- this is what got me here. And I, I will tell you what, wh- how, how I managed to do that also. <laughs> yeah. Just hearing you say the part about warming up or like the walking part, that is a very important component. And I've noticed that too. Sometimes when I run with a group and I see like, not with my usual running group, because with my friends, we pretty much have like, we walk for a few minutes, we start a slow jog, and then we start running. But <clears throat> if I sometimes do a, a, a regular group run with with other people that I'm not that familiar with, I noticed how quickly people start out. It's like this group run as if they're off to like a 5k sprint. And the pace yeah. of some of these group runs, it's just right away out of the gate, no warm up or anything, or right away exactly. like hard exactly. running. And it seems that the heart rate has a much harder time settling when it almost goes into this panic mode from zero to like <laughs> to like Ex- high exactly. intensity, pretty much. I, I mean, I mean, uh, f- funny enough, I had to did to ditch the social aspect of running at first because I had to experiment and I had to understand because you you know the peer pressure and the runner pressure all around you like they're they're picking up the pace and you feel like okay so I don't want to pick up pick up the pace because I has the I have this heart rate and even just to tell you here in Lebanon I got a lot I got bullied a lot about that so so you know you're going for for a heart rate how useful is that so come on uh, don't take it too seriously too diligently but be- because of my I mean aspect of OCD ish part like obsession being obsessive about the heart rate so i i, I mean I, I i'm very i'm i'm very orthodox about doing that like i go for if i want to go for a run in a math zone i i would never go for example higher than like 140 never ever even seeing 141 would piss me off <laughs> <laughs> believe it or not <laughs> That's that's classic. So so, how did you deal with those early stages? Like you just talked about, you did some walking. <laughs> exactly. Like uh, mentally, how did you deal with that? And do you have any recommendations for other people going through those early stages of low heart rate training? Uh, you, you know, the the key is uh, being consistent. This is one, and two, being humble in front of like i mean the 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 train and trusting the also trusting the program trusting i mean the 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 aspect of uh, progress uh, you need to let like let go your pride and your ego and to accept that you have some challenges that you need to face and let your body deal with that but but the issue is uh, that sometimes psychologically and uh, i mean mentally uh, we can't face the truth about being okay so am i losing fitness am not am i not being like a fast runner what's happening what's going on with me so but but you know Getting the support from all the people believing in the system and uh, just like seeing others and looking up to them and seeing how they're dealing with that and and just compare. I mean, not comparing and for the sake of comparing, just for to take a benchmark to understand where are they from that and how they become. For example, because when I saw you running, I I, I believed that you had the same, and I I listened to your podcasts and listened to your interviews and the videos that you make. And I, I totally relate 
to what you're saying. So being humble is key also, just like letting go your ego, just accepting the fact and being in the moment. And the, the, the most important part is being mindful, like being present, not to let go, for example, okay, so I want to think about something else. Because also, believe it or not, uh, if you're running and you let your like mind like like go or uh, not focusing on the moment, you would like affect your heart rate and your heart rate will spike without you knowing, like having all these stressors. And so so I disagree with the part where, they, for example, the, there are a lot of runners that would say, okay, so I do that for like taking taking a break from uh, from things and just like solving my problems. This is not the, this is not the case in running. If you want to run, just focus on the run, focus on what you're doing now, on your body, on your breath, on what you're thinking. So this is most, the most important and we can uh, talk about it uh, later on if you want yeah that that is very well said sometimes when i go out for a run it is very often for me a recovery from the day and it it almost is that you have a lot of thoughts during the day and it's almost like your brain kind of recovers from what's all happening in your and there's different ways to go about it, but I, I come back and I get a lot out of my runs that I come back from a run and I almost feel like, ah, I had a little therapy session with myself or like, it's just like this whole, yeah, you just feel re-energized again coming back, even though you just put an effort into it. So. Agree, agree. I, I totally agree with that. But I also like uh, focus on the part where while running, it's important like to focus on the moment, just being mindful, yes. but, but, but focus on your, I mean, your body, even what, like just try to observe your thoughts, not, not like mm -hmm. to hang on them, just try to observe, let, let them flow and observe them. Because I, I mean, in psychology, it's, it's, it's play, it's, it's very, very plain. I mean, let's say it's very uh, obvious. Like you, you have to be mindful while doing something. You have to have insight, uh, and you have to have that uh, trust while, while thinking about something. So, so the, while running, I do that a lot. I'm mindful. <laughs> I like, I, I do trust the thoughts that I'm okay. I let them go. I don't grab the thought, uh, thoughts and just like hang on to them. So, and this is how it goes usually. And especially if I have, I have high intensity sessions and there will go the struggle I mean, because <laughs> we, we will talk also about that. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit more because I find this fascinating to talk with you about the mental component because that is what you do for full-time work as well, exactly. right? Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit, what did you study and what do you do for, for daily life and, and how do you feel that has impacted how you look at this entire training journey too? Yeah, so so I'm a, I'm a psychologist by training. I'm a clinical psychologist and a psychotherapist, and I'm an assistant professor at uh, the Lebanese American University here in Beirut. And usually, uh, psychology has a large and huge impact in my life. It, it taught me a lot, uh, and I use everything that I studied and I was taught in my daily life. And uh, I translated that also into running. I find the combination with math is a very special if you if you want bond between the math training and the psychology aspect of running because they go hand in hand like wh 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 while you're running with a very slow pace and very mild pace and a mellow pace you have this also that your mind that is going okay everything is going to be all right so calm down don't panic because when you go very fast and you have this high heart rate so automatically you, you, your head and your brain will like enter into a panic mode and so it will get conflicting ideas and conflicting thoughts and so uh, so this is why I mean it, they, the, the psychology aspect of being like very calm steady uh, mellow uh, and mindful also so I have to, to like stress on that uh, that word and that concept uh, with math is a very nice combination so yeah. well said and I'm sure that you more than anyone also notices that direct correlation when your stress levels are higher, how that correlates in your your actual running paces as well. All of a sudden you start seeing elevated heart rates or slower exactly. running paces at the same heart rate and whatnot. So. 
Exactly. And and sometimes there is a bypass for that. I mean, if you train, this is very important because if you train yourself while having this high heart rate by being calm and fo- focusing, I mean, on the moment, you will be able to handle that pace and just like to get these assurances for for your body just not to panic. So it's, it's I mean, it's a phase, it's an endeavor, so don't worry, everything is going to be all right. So just, and this needs to be trained. I mean, your brain has to be trained on that. Uh, just to like come because sometimes when we go for uh, for a marathon pace a half marathon pace or a 10k or a 5k pace automatically we think that our our head should be at the same level or in my training i mean and how i approached this i i always try to like try to calm myself just like to remind myself you know it's 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 a phase and just try to concentrate and have these assurances for my brain okay everything is going to be all right don't worry so it's going to pass <laughs> and it's a phase <laughs> yes what were some of the improvements you started noticing over time what were some of those phases where you thought okay there might be something about this i'm starting to see gradual progress what was that what were some of those moments Actually, I started noticing that after six or eight months where I started seeing that correlation between the pace and my heart rate going lower. So th- th- it was a breakthrough. And actually, I was like, like okay, relieved. I, I thought, you know, I, I, w- I will never be there. Uh, <laughs> but I started seeing that from one day to another. And uh, I, I, I started also reading a lot like educating myself also, like watching podcasts, hearing podcasts, listening to podcasts, I mean, reading books. And I started like playing on those like variables that I didn't believe that much into, for example, sleep, nutrition, (laughs) uh, uh, like uh, meditation, for example, all of these like tiny variables that would have a huge impact. And I started like being a researcher on myself, like a scientist, self science, <laughs> like, like myself, like my body is a self project. So I started experimenting with that. For example, if I go for sleep, for example, 10 and I woke up at five, how would be my heart rate? If I walk, for example, for 10 minutes and then I start running, how would be my session? So if I like the things that I eat, uh, and usually, you know, I do this, what we call the intermittent fasting. So the impact of intermittent fasting on my runs, if I tweak a bit my nutrition, uh, adding a little, a little, a little, a little bit of carbs or eating a, a bit more or a bit less. So how would like all of these, all of these parameters would change my heart rate. So this is where I got this breakthrough and I, I started like seeing progress with that. But but the most important thing I really realized the impact of like sleep and nutrition. These two parameters had huge impact on and the stress levels, of course, of the work, like just trying to handle work in a in a better way. Uh, I mean, time management, stress management, and all of that, and all of these techniques. So it helped a lot. So th- th- there was my breakthrough. So that was six to eight months. That's quite some time before yeah. you started yeah. having some of the and. And so until then, were you still somewhat doubtful about this working? Very, or very were you... like, yeah, exactly. Like because... I, I told you, like, oh, it was like f- facing my demons, actually. I thought I would never be able to run. No, really, I, I thought I, w- I would never be able to run because uh, also one, one of my, believe it or not, also psychologically, one of my uh, highest like achievement back in the time was I, I, I always wanted to do a sub three marathon. So now I brag about mm. it. Like I do it every two weeks <laughs> 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 and my next project, because you, 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 you had once, uh, I forgot her name. Actually, it was, it, it's my bad. Uh, she, she did a marathon, a sub three marathon at math level. So I'm aiming for that now. <laughs> I think, that, I think that was, might've been Larissa Danish. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Larissa. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah. So this is my next project. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. Keep, keep bringing that aerobic pace down. (laughs) So, yeah. And so when, when did you, like, there's a lot of different directions we can take this, but when did you run your first marathon? What year Mm -hmm. was that? And what time, what time did you finish that in? Okay. So my first marathon was in 2014 without any training. I just decided to run a marathon. No, and if I look back at it, I I say to myself, I am a bit crazy, actually. How could I, how did I do that, actually? How did I finish? I didn't know. So 
I went for uh, four hours. Mm-hmm. I did the four hours marathon, just like oh, you, and you, you, I, you yeah, that's, actually that's, finished in four yes, hours. Yes, yes, yes. I finished in four hours. That's that was my first marathon, and what wow. I did. What, what was the worst can I mean can happen? So I would run and and then I would walk. I would run and I would walk. I, I looked back at it like. A, one year or two years ago, actually. And I realized that I was running at a pace of 4.20 and then like walking for 15, 10, 15, like 20 minutes and then running at a 4.20 for 15 and 10, 20 minutes. So I said, I must be crazy. I must be crazy. <laughs> Sometimes it's... It, it and is actually, I hated it. I hated it. I hated it a lot. Oh, yeah. And I, I, it took me like one week to recover i i rem- i still till till that day till now i remember what was my feeling at, on it was an, on, on a sunday it was in november so i still <laughs> know the feeling i was I, i'm sure i was dehydrated i was carb depleted my muscles were destroyed so and i still know the feeling and i hated it and i told myself i would never run a marathon anymore i don't want to run a marathon <laughs> this is this is self-torture i don't want to do it anymore (laughs) that is exactly what i told myself when i finished my first marathon and indeed same thing i well i didn't go out like at a sub three hour pace and then have to walk and then like i just ran rather like above my fitness level until about whatever 30k and at that point the wheels fell apart and it was a dead march to the finish (laughs) but it was a similar thing and i think many listeners could relate to that as well that yeah after first marathon when things don't go according to plan or any race really it's very often i'll never do that again until it kind of fades away and then it wasn't that bad and then before you know it you sign up again for the next one kind of thing exactly so yeah and then what was your now that you know that running a marathon could be really hard what was your second marathon like how did Um, you approach that differently it it was a bit better i trained for it but uh, but not i mean not proper training but it was like uh, it was a, here in a club uh, in, in Beirut in Lebanon. So what I did is it was a 318 and then I went for a sub three after it, like a 259, uh, 56 or something like that in Berlin. And then I switched to the math training and there was the magic. So what what ended up happening from there? What, I was injured, actually. What, I was injured. I had uh, mm-hmm. I had like a, a hip fracture after the after the Berlin marathon, and then I started like uh, uh, taking a break, and then I went for uh, for the math training. Yeah, was that fracture from running or was it? From it, something it was else? like I, I mean I mean it was from running. It was from like high impact high impact running. Okay. So this was the reason. And then I went I, I took a break like for like six months or something like that, and just I shifted to math and then. Then a lot lower intensity exactly back into things. And then after you had gone through a period of low heart rate training, how, how many months of low heart rate training did you do? How did that transition go to adding in some speed work and then your next race? How did that go? I mean, I, I never, I never uh, ditched the high intensity sessions. I would like, uh, I kept uh, doing high intensity sessions once or twice a week. I always did that and I, I, I enjoyed that actually. But in a very like very short intervals, not that long and long tempo runs, and uh, I, I was even I was listening to your courses and the, the videos that you made. So what I had in mind, and also I always use that till now, I, I always aim to build a very huge aerobic pace while I'm training all year long. Like if you look, for example, at my heart rate ratios or percentages, you would see like I have 80 or 85 percent of all my runnings are or all my run se- running sessions are or around like below 138, 137 heartbeat per minute for, for 85 of the I mean running sessions for a year, for mm-hmm. a month, whether it be I mean for a week. And then I would like add these fifteen percent or fifteen percent of high intensity, medium intensity sessions, like going by pace and by feel, 
and and this is it. This is how I do it. I always build a huge, a very huge aerobic base. And this actually what helped me to go for the 100 miles. And this is what helped me to go for the 600K with 1200 meters elevation gain all around Lebanon. So I did the, the circle of Lebanon on the bike. <laughs> yeah, I want to hear more about that in a little bit here. So after you did this kind of newer training approach for you how did how did your races further improve in the marathon distance from there hugely actually one year and a half further i I registered for berlin marathon in 2000 actually 19 and i went for a 250 two hours 50 minutes and actually i went one year more uh, one year ahead also so i went for valencia and i went for a 248 and then I went for Rotterdam. The the in la, it was last April, and I went for two forty six. So hmm. I mean, I mean, I, I uh, my approach also as is very. I, I mean, I go this in a very uh, diligent, and I I'm very careful while tackling my PBs. I don't go for huge PBs. If you look at them, they are always like between this one minute and thirty seconds, and just I go by feel. And for example, I would push like. But the, I always aim for a negative split, like you always do, actually. So I learned that from you. So actually, I would go like with my first 30, 35K, very like mellow b- b- by feel and taking how my heart rate into account. And then I would push for the last 7K and see how, how it goes. So this is how, how usually how I tackle my races. And this is usually how I s- saw my improvement. So actually with a very huge aerobic base, 15, 10, 12, 15% of high intensity, medium intensity sessions. And it comes naturally, actually. actually. You have to believe in the system and it will come, come naturally. So th- this is important also. <laughs> How do you deal with the heat in Lebanon? Because I know several months out of the year, it's really hot out there. How do you deal with it? What is your way of approaching that? Actually, is my it's my candy store. <laughs> tell, tell me more <laughs> yeah because because i mean i learned that also from you believe it or not so uh, uh i was introduced to sauna training uh because you mentioned it a lot in your videos and i started experimenting and i understood because my my, my gut my i mean my instinct always pushed me to go on the treadmill in summer like okay i want to i want to avoid the heat because it's not that good uh, but I learned I learned that while training in in the heat, I mean, I'm I'm not putting yourself in danger, of course, like hydrating, uh, running uh, uh, in the morning, like when the, the temperature, for example, here in Lebanon, it goes even in the morning like thirty degrees Celsius. So uh, so like being careful and not putting yourself in danger, but running in the heat is very beneficial. I mean, for the whole body. And while going from uh, 30 degrees to 12 or 10 degrees, it would like have a huge impact on the performance. So I learned that. So to keep to keep myself up to the level and in the performance, and in winter usually I do the I do the sauna also sessions just to keep myself in the game. Because if if I would like not go to the sauna in winter and I introduce myself to training, for example, in the summer. It would take me a lot of time just to adapt and adjust. So what I usually do is in the winter, like when the, 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 the temperatures are around 10 to 20 here in Lebanon, I would go to the sauna three times per week, like doing 15 to 20 minutes session three times to four times per week. And then in, this, in the summer, it would go naturally because if you go out, I mean, you are already in the sauna, <laughs> so you're good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this is what I do. Um... The, the sauna is, is a big one. And I think if you have good thermal regulation, if your body is able to cool itself down, warm itself up, less energy is going to like keeping your body temperature under control and more energy can go to your body moving forward quicker. And exactly. It's, it's, this, exactly. it's this fine line. And this is why often we notice even at the beginning of a season, if it's like when you go into spring after like a winter and you have like been able to run in the cold for quite some time, those first sessions, the first four weeks or six weeks when the weather gets warmer, it, there's totally that adjustment phase again. And so if we, if we experiment with 
taking some sauna and just in a way that you're doing that even during the winter months doing that from time to time you're definitely a bit more used yeah. to it by the time summer temperatures come around again so. exactly you, you know uh, what i noticed also because the thing is that sometimes when i st- i didn't understand that but uh, but but with time i understood it more even with the cold i mean exposure to the cold it has the same effect with with uh, with the heat so basically if i go like not not putting my i mean like my my winter gear on i would notice uh, my heart rate would spike for the first 10 minutes like it goes it shoots up like to 158 160 beats per minute so for example is my strap is going like it's not it's not working or is my battery is is depleted or something like that and i said no my body is adjusting so mm-hmm. well, how how I would do it, and also I learned it the hard way, now I'm doing it a lot. So I start walking for five to 10 minutes just to get myself adapted and my body to adapt to the environment all around. And then I would start running. I don't start running like, for example, I do, I do that uh, when I uh, like kicking off, kicking off the, the, the watch and just started running. I don't do that anymore. So I just get myself adapted, get my body adapted, and then I would start running. Yeah. yeah there you go what about goal setting how do you approach goal setting what are your thoughts on failure i would love to hear some thoughts there yeah so i mean uh, for me as a psychologist goal setting goes with uh, personality uh, and with how disciplined the person can be uh, and discipline can be taught yeah i mean putting motivation aside if you put yourself in a in an environment where you have to go through pain or set a goal to go to, to, through that uh, through that environment just to to reach that goal it's very important in a way <clears throat> Okay, so if you look at people setting goals, you will see that they have the sense of accomplishment. You will be like, okay, so you have the sense of accomplishment. You will feel, you will have this better self-esteem. You will have what we call a self-actualization. And I always search for that, actually. So, but my personality drives me through, I mean, pain and all the challenges just to get to this point where I would like enhance my self-esteem and get this self-actualization. I always do that. So while setting my goal, I take this into a mindset where I know that the impact would be huge on my self and I would like respect myself more and I would cherish myself more. So th- this is important to me because coming from a I mean, I, I grew up in a country where <laughs> there are so much, so many challenges and uh, so many hurdles and uh, so many obstacles coming, whether it be uh, like social, political, like, uh, economy, so all of that. So I can't afford uh, also like to look at myself and pity myself. So uh, setting a goal would push me and uh, would let me understand that i have capabilities and i have these resources that I can uh, that i can attain and uh, i found that through endurance sports and i found especially in, in running and running marathons and ultra marathons i found that i found this in that i don't know if yeah, my idea was I, clear but uh, oh no 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 it 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 was and just looking at some of the like you have grown a lot as an athlete over the last five years and even training volume, racing distance, racing project, adventure, not only while running, but even on your bike. What was, what is one project that stands out to you that you're, that you've been very excited about to train towards um, and that you were able to accomplish? Like what is one of those? <coughs> projects for you and why was that an important project for you okay so um, i'm gonna tell you a secret i never uh planned for 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 for, i mean for a project i never planned for it uh i I mean uh, from from the outside it would show like i was planning a lot uh, but i would give you an example on the first the 31st of december like two years ago i had this revelation that i wanted to do because i saw you do it a hundred miles 
160.9 kilometers. It's not 160 kilometers. It's very important because here in Lebanon, we go by kilometer. We don't go by miles. Mm. So when well, I had my friends with me, like supporting me in the last like three, four kilometers, they told me, so we some, you are at the 160. I told them, no, we still have 900 <laughs> meters to go. <laughs> and those 900 meters would matter. Uh, so uh, I never, I never like planned for a project, but I had this like urge to do something. So once I had this urge, I would, uh, uh, the math training gave me this opportunity to be always ready. I mean, I, I'm always ready for that because I, I train consistently and I do that. I mean, like high mileage and, and letting my body recover and l- listening to my body, uh, 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 running, uh, running in a way that would not affect, that would not put me in danger or in an injury aspect, but also, uh, uh, giving me benefits and pushing me forward. So I always felt that I'm always ready and I wanted to test that. Even psychologically, I mean, so I wanted to test that. So I decided, for example, on the first, 31st of December to go for 100 miles. But it wasn't a 100 miles like 100 miles because I saw you also doing that, like running from point A to point B. So I decided to go to the south of Lebanon. It's the Naura. <laughs> it's, the Naura it's the Naura city, Naura village. It's in the south. It's uh, at the border with Palestine. So when I started running from there at 4 a.m., I went from Beirut by car uh, with a friend who put me on the border there, and I started running. On the fir- thir- thirty, it was the thirty fir- first of December, and I started running from there. At f- I started at 4 a.m. I finished at 8 p.m. in Batroun. Batroun it was in the north, so I covered like 161 kilometers. I never stopped. In my in my head, it was like I was doing four marathons in a row. So like doing one marathon, one marathon to go, two marathons, three marathons, and four marathons, and there you go. I finished. So and then I, I was I was I was like laughing. So now Strava, you can share my my statistics because it was like the, the hype about sharing statistics and what you did and the longest runs. So and i was i was featured either or even on the television here in lebanon on uh, on a national broadcast television so telling this crazy uh, phd psychologist did on the 31st of december 100 miles going from naura to batroun <laughs> to batroun <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, is, so I felt always more... ready. This this is this is this is the takeaway take away message because I'm very grateful for math training because uh, I mean especially training at an aerobic like level because it gave me the opportunity to experiment and to to go beyond my potential uh, b- because I'm sure if I was like training like before I couldn't and I ev- even didn't have a second second thought about doing that and seeing my potential but it has it had this is what we mentioned before it had a lot of impact on myself and my self esteem and how i see myself actually i can do that and it 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 had a huge impact on everything else in my life like my work my professional career my my friends uh, the, the family all around me so so yeah <laughs> How do you, or what recommendations do you have for listeners when they're at any race distance, like you did a 100-mile adventure run and you're encountering challenges at some point? How do you deal with it and what recommendations do you have for other runners, whether it is on their first 5K, on a half marathon, marathon, any distance when you encounter challenges? Okay, so when we say challenges, it's get, getting out of your comfort zone. And when you say getting out of your, I always say it. When you get say getting out of your comfort zone is like facing the pain. Usually, people are afraid of pain, so they do whatever it counts just to avoid pain. What I tell them, and what I learn, for example, from the gurus, like uh, take for example David Goggins. I mean, this is my role model in life. <laughs> like, if, if you if you want to get better, or like, like I mean, uh, even there is uh, there are rich role even mention it. So uh, if you want to get to get better, you have to face the pain. You can't like bypass and being and 
and be a, a very productive or, uh, I mean, successful person without facing the pain. So while tackling races, it's important. This is what I told myself. Pain is inevitable. I know that. So I wouldn't like shy away or like hide from it. I want to face it. So I know that. Uh, and I, I know how it feels. And uh, uh, <laughs> uh, funny enough, I was addicted to it. So I always search for it now. Like I always search for it and I was like uh, looking out, okay, wh- wh- how can I get pain? How can I get out of my comfort zone and how can I face pain and how can I deal with it? Because with every experience, I learn a lot and it would like getting me better by the day. So this, th- I th- think, this I, is th- I think mentally, is- this is it. I think it's important that last part that you say there mentally, because when we're talking about discomfort or pain, it is not necessarily physical pain in our body. It can be 100%. the discomfort of mentally having to do X, Y, or Z. Exactly. And sometimes that might might even be, you know, you have to do X like this work project, but it's so easy and you get so much more gratification from grabbing your phone and doing social media, watching Netflix or eating cookies or whatever, yet you know this is what you should be doing. And in some extent, that is mental pain as well. It's mental discomfort. Exactly. And so I think this is an important distinction here too, that even slowing down your pace, your running pace or your running intensity, when you know you could be running faster and it might be challenging at certain stages, that can be seen as like a mental pain or, or challenge as well. To some extent, right? 100%, 100%. I, don't, I, I totally agree with you. And this is actually, this is a revelation now. I, I Actually, when I wake up, I don't feel like motivated. Okay, so I want to go for a run. I would like push myself and I know it's painful. Even if, if I know that it would be like a very easy, mellow run. So... This is what we call the mental pain. Okay, so I want to go through that. I want to face that. This is how I learn, actually. And this is how I grew, by like facing this every day. And by getting used to it, actually, the brain will like associate between physical pain and mental pain. And but my tips aren't always like, if you want to race, uh, if you want to have a good race, what would you do? Like my nutrition? Okay. So uh, I would take carbs. It's not, it's not that it's not the thing. Or I would like go for a negative split, taking the first part as very slow and then pushing for the last part. Okay. So th- th- those are all good and they are the, like the building blocks. But there is something more important is where you have to like hijack or trick your brain into pushing through the pain and getting used to it because you will not, you can't escape the pain. Even in, it will translate. I mean, if you go for 100 miles, you would see it like going very slow. It's not like putting all your, all your I mean, your, all your speed out. Like you go very slow. And I, I, for example, in the 100 miles, I always tried to keep my heart rate below 135 beats per minute. I was watching that. So at the, la- at the last, I mean, like 10, 20 kilometers, it was shooting up to 160, 165. I couldn't handle even like walking for uh, six minutes per kilometer. But I knew it and it was very painful. It was very painful. <laughs> but I, I was used to that. Yeah. You, you you played your cards more wisely than I did with keeping your heart rate under 135 because I somehow made the mistake of trying to keep it under 148 and that was the yeah. first whatever 50 or 60 miles and at that point I realized that I'd started too quick and it's hard to recover from that and so exactly. once again exactly. in in some of those some of those races sometimes here's the thing though and I feel this applies to any race distance whether you ran your first marathon here and you had never gone that far, like you go out at a certain pace and then you realize, ah, oh, I have to dial it back a little bit and then you have to, then you can run again. And then the more we race, the more we respect the distance, the more we become familiar with how to pace ourselves. And this is sometimes we get these questions of, okay, I'm training at a low heart rate and I'm starting to add in some high intensity. What should be my race pace? And that is Mm. the more we race, the more we get a better understanding of where we're going to be at, what kind of marathon pace we will be able to hold. And and, exactly, 
this exactly this 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 Definitely. is the exciting part of that but like you said earlier too when you're going through some of these experiments when you're like paying close attention to your body paying close attention with some of the experiments you were doing with intermittent fasting or with nutrition or with sleep or with stress levels paying close attention writing that down in a journal taking your learnings and from there on adjusting again to seeing what what you can optimize and that's that's how exactly. we keep learning so yeah yeah oh yeah that's that that's a big one what about um like any other recommendations that you have for other people who might come from a no pain no gain mentality or they might be new to low heart rate running altogether like for some of these people to get started with this do you have any thoughts or any recommendations about the journey that is ahead for them uh <laughs> I mean, it's hard for them. To, I mean, it's hard to convince them. But uh, uh, but I will repeat what I said before: like being humble and being consistent is key in math training, and the benefits that you can have from math is are huge. But but coming from a pain no gain, I, I mean, Flores, it's a bit hard for, to to convince because I saw that uh, here in Lebanon, they, they they started using the the heart rate concept like lately because they were seeing that there are people or myself like adopting this philosophy and doing what we're doing so they started seeing uh, benefits so this is why they shifted but the 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 issue when they realized that with this shift they need to slow down the, they didn't like the system so i don't know it has no it's not no benefits even i'm not i'm not i'm not a fan this is not for me as if math training is for people and for for special people and it's it's a, for a special group of people so so yeah so uh, convincing someone coming from a pain no gain uh, i mean for me also as a psychologist i'm a true believer that math has its own uh, it, its own people and its own population and its own uh, personalities. You have to be very like okay. You have for me it, it, it has two concept, two two components. The first component is you have to be obsessive, very obsessive about it, or it doesn't work. <laughs> two, you have to be you have to let go your ego and be very humble. Uh, this is why I have a huge respect, huge huge respect for people that would practice math, but go that have a very huge aerobic base, like 80, 85% of the, 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 their training coming from, because for example, at a, at a five or a six minutes kilom per kilometer. So, so yeah, those are the two components, being humble and being obsessive. So math has, and this is my theory, this is my own theory. I mean, I, there's no one who told me about it. So it, uh, math has its own people. I think you make a very valid point there that the whole approach of like the whole math low heart rate training approach and there's different ways to calculate a low heart rate training zone but I think the whole part that got me excited about math training in general is how much emphasis is put on all the other elements outside of running as well. And you mentioned ego earlier and ego is a big part of this big part in a way of having to slow down not not like thinking longer term not thinking so short term and really not caring what other people would think about getting passed on the bike path what you post on strava any of those kind of things exactly. and let's face it yeah. there's there's a lot of people who pay attention to that or who care about that part but i think the more we can drop any of our ego or how we see ourselves or how we think the world sees us, the more we can just live and be our true version of ourselves, the, the happier we can be, I feel. And um, that's not for everyone. That That is not. And that is okay. But I feel the, the people eventually experience some of the benefits that come with it and whether that takes six or eight months before you start noticing it there's other people who start noticing it earlier than that there's some people who might even have to go at it for a longer period of time there's there's quite some people who have such high stress levels in their life who have been training at such high intensities for so long that they are going to go backwards first they have to de-stress first before they can start going forward and i think 
Yeah, that Definitely. is a humbling experience. That and and yeah, there's, there's a lot to that. So yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, let me see. What are yeah? I want to talk to you briefly about a bike accident that you had because two yeah. years ago you had a near death experience. What exactly? What happened there exactly? Because that made a big impact in your life. So uh, I was actually I was preparing for for an Ironman for the Ironman uh, that I did in September last September. So uh, it was during COVID and I was on the highway with my friend and uh, it was uh, actually it is a bit stressful for me to talk about it but uh, I will tell you the, the, the long story short. We were uh, at the side of the road and uh, just waiting for another friend. Suddenly, there was someone who was like uh, texting and driving without like paying attention uh, on the road. So he hit me from the back, and he he panicked actually. So I went uh, under the vehicle, and I passed. <laughs> the, behind the vehicle on the highway. Yes, so it was a, a bit of bruises and stitches on my back, and that was it. I had to stop for like one week and a half, and I. It's crazy. So you were you were standing you were standing still while he hit you. Yes, yes. So actually, you I was on the bike. I was on the bike. So he hit the bike first. I I, I felt someone was like dragging me. And then uh, he panicked, so he continued. He didn't stop, actually. So I went through under the vehicle. I went literally under. I was under the vehicle. So I was, and he, like, I, I was under the vehicle. And then I stood in, in, in the middle of the highway. Like, I was, there was cars all around. And so, and then I threw myself on the side, side of the road. Uh, so, and that was it. I had to stop for one week, one week and a half. And I had this, like, uh, but very, uh, I, I I couldn't believe that I would also uh, bike anymore. But I like, I was consisting, and I was I was insisting that I want to do an Ironman. I want to go for an Ironman. I never swam, just to tell you. So <laughs> I prepared for that for four 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 uh, three months actually, like swimming every day. And it, by the way, swimming had a huge impact on my running. In and I biked a lot. In what sort? In what? In what sort of way? I mean, I, I, I aerobically like? because because uh, yeah. I mean, while while swimming, I was um, uh, because I, I am a data freak, <laughs> and I always measure like my heart rate and all of that. So I noticed like while swimming, I always keep my heart rate at uh, like one one ten one fifteen beats per minute while doing a lot of effort. Uh, even I can get my heart rate very high. This is one and two. This, uh, the, the I mean, the feeling of the water and putting yourself in the water and this, uh, like getting your your core temperature up and there's something all around you, lowering the temperature down. So this would cool like your body and taking your heart rate very low. So it had a huge impact on my running at MAF. So I benefited a lot. Uh, and the bike also add 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 to that the bike. So actually, the bike also had a huge impact. Uh, like, and I was experimenting. Actually, I was doing the, ma- the the Ironman for one reason. Like, I was experimenting the run. So how would my uh, performance would be on the run? I was looking forward for the run while doing the Ironman. <laughs> so now I finished my swim. I want to go for a bike. Just let me finish one 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 hundred eighty k, and let me see what I can do on the run. <laughs> By the way, Duke was one of my role models also. I was aiming for, I, 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 I thought I could go for a, a sub three, but I couldn't. I went for a 315, but the temperature was like a killer for me. The temperature and and even, you, you, you know, uh, funny enough, uh, the people who practice the Ironman, they don't run. So I realized that while I was running because they don't have the manners of the running or the not runner. Mm-hmm. They can stand in the way. They walk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we have the loop. We have a loop that we go with circles, like 10 kilometers loop. <laughs> I thought I was doing a marathon, so I, I, it was like running in the backyard of the. I mean, in the yeah, backyard, yeah, yeah, doing yeah. this. <laughs> that is, that is quite an experience, though, because you're yeah you're you have more experience in the running component, and then adding in swimming, and then adding in uh, the the cycling as well. 
I a few weeks ago I bought one of the Wahoo bike trainers yeah, here that I have I have now in my office and it's been really fun. I'm actually going on bike rides with my dad in Amsterdam and we're riding remote on yeah. Swift and just catching up on FaceTime while getting getting to ride for an hour hour and a half and I have noticed like just doing that like once or twice a week it's some nice additional training that you're able to add in there with limited exactly. wear and tear on the body. And then I notice also from time to time I'm going swimming with Duke or with some other friends here locally. And I'm not a swimmer. I never grew up swimming, but I started getting into it a little bit. And what a great way of even training there. Like I come back and I really feel sore on the shoulders, but in a good way of like, all right, got to got a workout in there. Like those muscles are not that well developed yeah. yet. Yeah. Uh, but then just the addition of that to some of the other, yeah, the aerobic development that comes across in uh, running again too is, is great. So Yeah, 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 sure. Sure. I mean, I mean, and, and that, I mean, doing a cross training for, I mean, uh, for the purpose of in enhancing or getting better and running is, is crucial for me. It's crucial. Yeah, absolutely. So would you do another Ironman or was this a no, one time? No, thing no, for you? no, no, not my likely. It wasn't uh, just to prove myself that I can do one. And here in Lebanon, there are not, <laughs> there are not, there, there aren't a lot of people who did the Ironman. So I had this like on my bucket list and I wanted to do that. So I just did it. Like I, t I took the decision yeah, yeah. in one year and I prepared for that for four months. By the way, I kept my mileage like very high and running. I just like add, added uh, a, a, a swim, swim sessions, not high intensity. All of them was a very low intensity. And I finished my 4K in one hour 20. So it was like two minutes per 100 meters. And uh, mm -hmm. the bike was also like doing very low heart rate training at the bike. So I finished that in five hours, ten minutes, or something like that. So it was, it was. I, I did. Yeah, but the, the, this is this is the point. Like I was doing all of my training sessions for the iron and a very low heart rate, and I was a huge believer because I I know that endurance sports need a very huge aerobic base. It goes without saying. I mean. mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. Sounds like it, it worked out well for you there. How do you combine it all? You're a, you're a father, you work, and still you're able to train high volume. What is your approach? I, I, I wake up very early. <laughs> this is, how, this is how key. How early? What, what, I mean, 4.30, 4.15 4 4 a.m., 4.15, 4.30, this, this is my, well, I mean, this is when, when I wake up. And usually I go early to bed. Uh, and I finish my sessions like at nine, nine thirty, and then I go to work and this is it. And I start working from nine, nine thirty to like six or five. And sometimes if I have like, uh, evening sessions or night sessions, I would do them, but it would be only for recovery, not like, uh, putting a high impact, uh, just to get myself at ease and let my body recover. And this is it. Uh, but I'm a very early riser. And I do believe in that. And like, actually, Andrew Huberman, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with Andrew. Oh, Andrew absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I love, I love his he podcast. Is, exactly. He's a, he's a big advocate of, I mean, early rising, like, uh, early light exposure and all of that. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge believer. And I, it was a game changing, of, of course, for me. So th this is how I managed to do that. Like I, I, I always say that like, if you want something, you can always find a way. Like you can't say, I don't have time to do that or I don't have time to do this. So if you, I mean, you always have time if you put your head it in. Just, it, it just comes down to being willing to make sacrifices, right? It's exactly. like you can't, you can't do it all. So you have to identify what are the things that I want to do and what are the things I don't want to do. And that also Definitely. means saying saying no to great opportunities. And I feel that is sometimes one of the harder parts where you might have some opportunities come up and you have to still say no to some of those as well. But as long as you know what is your priority. like that's uh, Exactly. Having a priority also, I mean, and okay, so setting goals is one of them also, but, but I mean, having priorities and what we call... Uh, like adaptative behaviors. So something that would help you to go through and to push forward. I mean, if you, you can't like have it all or, uh, I mean, like putting something into your head and you want to set a goal and not 
doing all the, the tiny and tiny bits of pieces uh, all around you to help you to do that, like sleeping well, getting your nutrition right. Uh, I mean, like having supportive family, of course, this is crucial. Uh, having supportive friends. So, I mean, if you if, if I if I would like have one uh, one aspect uh, taking out, uh, or I have uh, some a negative comment from one of my friends, it would affect me. So, I would choose my friends very wisely. I would choose my supportive, I mean, family very wisely. I would like have a, a, a focus on sleep, on nutrition, all of that. So, so yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up. I think the people you surround yourself with indeed have a huge impact on how you feel, how you like, Definitely. whether it is energy draining or whether you get energy out of it. And and that part alone is, um, yeah, I sometimes take inventory of that too, of like, where yeah. am I yeah. spending my time? And, and is this, this, this where I want to be spending my time too? Because I feel sometimes it is so easy to just say yes to certain invitations that might come up instead of you thinking what is it really that i want to do and like the, the whole art of saying no it is hard but i think as i've gotten older and as i have gotten busier as well with two young kids and and different things going on I've become a little bit more comfortable with saying no more quickly. And that has actually served me quite well because it also means that I can say yes to the things that I truly do care about or move more forward towards those areas. So, Yeah, you're totally yeah. right. You're, to you're totally right. And th this is important. This is very important. Like, uh, And I, I, I can relate. I mean, I can relate because having, having supportive, supportive people all around and around you is very important and they can help you get through it yeah one, one part that i've one part that i've found that is a big part of my running um what do you call it like i, I always have a bit of a running routine of like i know what day of the week i'm gonna be running it's just like it's it's quite flexible but i know for example every tuesday night i run together with two of my friends and it's hmm. like Duke and Joseph, they come by the house at six o'clock. We meet up, we go for an hour, hour and a half run. Afterwards, we chill in the sauna for a little bit. We have like, we catch up in the sauna and then like we go in the ice bath and then we walk over and we grab some food. And it's like every yeah. Tuesday night, it's like two friends that is just part of like the weekly routine. And I look forward to it. We're all busy dads. It's like this time of the week that we can catch up. And I feel that social component of being able to like surround yourself with good people over there is such an important part over there as well, because I feel everyone is busy these days. Everyone has a lot going on. And yes, a lot of us are running individually, but sometimes doing that with some good, reliable friends, it's, it's an important one there too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, agree. What a what about recovery for you? Are there any recovery tools or any anything like you mentioned sleep earlier? But is there anything yeah. else that you're doing on the, on the uh, recovery? <laughs> when it comes to recovery, I'm very I mean like I'm an obsessive freak. <laughs> I'm a half <laughs> physiotherapist, if you want, because I invested a lot there in recovery. Go. And yeah, so so for example, I bought the Normatec. I have uh, the Marco Pro, Pro Plus, the Electro Recovery machine i go into ice baths uh, sauna is one of the i mean tools that i use also for recovery massage uh, going to a physiotherapist so all of that i take it very diligently and uh, and this is what i owe to my body because my body is giving me so this is a mindset that i always tell myself if you want to if if, if i need something from my body that is giving me uh, so I need I need to pay back. So this is my payback. This is what I give back to my body. So this is important. And the nutrition aspect. Uh, I mean, I I don't I don't advocate for intermittent fasting. But uh, the thing is that, and I read a lot of articles and evidence and research about it. And I saw that intermittent fasting has a huge impact on recovery. Okay, I I know that eating after a thirty like a, in a in a thirty minutes window after a workout is important and all of that. And I don't like uh, push people or add uh, 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 like give advice to people to do it like I do. But uh, I mean, my, my concept of nutrition is 
uh, that I I want to take control of my nutrition, not my nutrition taking control over me. And this is important to me. So this is why I always like find a way to just go into a, a huge like periods of uh, time where I go into fasting like. 20 sometimes 21 hours and then i would eat like in two or three hours and then i do that again sometimes when i have a high intensity very high it's like a very long session like three hours or uh something like that i would like okay if we get into, into some nutrition like fat or uh, uh, proteins and a little a very low low carbs but uh and and um, actually, I learned that from Zach Bitter because I watched that Zach Bitter. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, yeah, Zach yeah, Bitter. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. He, he has we, this, we had him on, this the whole... on the podcast too. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember. So so Zach Bitter is a huge, I mean, advocate for a low carb, uh, high fat diet and intermittent fasting and all of that. So and like the carb cycling and where he goes up and down uh, depending mm. on the sessions so i'm now integrating that into into my into my routine i i do have a question about this part though because you're you're quite extreme as far as for exactly right, exactly high, I, am, high, I am no 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 i don't know so so i'm i'm fascinated by this so you're going high volume you're running 100 mile plus weeks you're still doing sometimes cycling or swimming um that's a lot of training intensity or training load. You're at 15 hours of training a week. Train, exactly. So when you're <laughs> having an eating, when you have an eating window of like only three hours, how in the world are you able to get in enough calories and, and like feel that you're able to digest it well and... and uh, what what how how does that look like? What do you? What do I, you mean, I mean, I mean, what sort of order? Exactly. I I mean, if you want to try fat, fat it's easy. I mean, like you can consume a very <laughs> very small amount of fat, like in two thousand, three thousand calories, and that's it. I mean, um, people has them has a they have a misconception about like calorie deficit. Okay, so I I would go for example for three thousand calories per day. I would take that mm -hmm. in like four avocados and two chicken breasts and that's it, <laughs> to be honest with you. And that's it. Uh, and th th this I, is very easy. Uh, I, I mean, you I, can, you you can three, take 3,000 calories. Are you at 3,000 3, calories with that already? <laughs> Uh, actually, no, not not that much. But I mean, like, if you go like for for one avocado, it's like six hundred or five hundred or something like that. Uh, you go for two two thousand five hundred or two thousand eight hundred. So it would be like creating a balance between uh, the ins and outs. And this is what I usually do. Uh, I would not, now I would like uh, add some carbs into the mix. Uh, but what helped me also uh, is. Uh, like doing weight training because I do weight training a lot, so th this th 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 it has a huge impact. And uh, like while doing sports, you won't feel this hunger because uh, e even after I finish, for example, my session, I would feel I wouldn't feel that hungry. And sometimes I would play on uh, adding uh, fibers into my diet, like a lot of greens, salads, mm -hmm. and this would help me a lot. So yeah. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, there is. Um, yeah, you're you're definitely. And I know we have we've previously had some conversation about this part as well. But I've always found it interesting to see how you were able to do a lot of these nutritional experiments and and just see what like in an N of one what at least worked well for you and some things work better than other things. And uh, it sounds like you've learned a lot there over the years. So. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I noticed also like my performance would be it would be a, a way better. Like, uh, for example, I did in my uh, my preparation for the next for the coming marathon. So I did like two training sessions where where I ran like uh, two sub three marathons two weeks apart, like two fifty eight, two fifty eight, and I went like one without having breakfast and uh, fasted all all uh, in the whole run and the other one i just added some uh, two actually two morton gels one at uh, 30 minutes mark and the other one at the 2 hours 15 mark so just like just to experiment to see the impact of my performance believe it or not it didn't change a lot yeah the only the only thing that i will say to that though 
is although some of these things you could some people can get away with it some people could do it is it necessarily optimal for the best performance out there on race day and or afterwards I don't think for so. recovery? I don't think so. Exactly. I, I, me, me neither. I mean, me neither. I'm not. I, I told you. I told. I started my 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 talk with. I'm not a. I'm not an advocate. I'm not telling people to do that. I'm just experimenting, and I fi- I find actually maybe it's a bit psychological, Flores. I I like the. I, I I as I told you, I enjoy the pain, so I always face it, and sometimes doing that. Would would get me in, into this zone of pain faster <laughs> so i would struggle like oh, what the heck i'm doing that so let me continue yeah actually one well, of my marath- i told you already that one of my one of my marathons in i mean berlin what when i did the 250 it was fasted i didn't take any carbs <laughs> and just water that that that's right that was right i here's the thing though as much as your you go extreme with some of this stuff i can relate because even i take quite frequent ice baths and there's a discomfort factor in the early stages of an ice bath but what i've also found though is when you put yourself in uncomfortable situations and you become more comfortable with it it makes other uncomfortable situations during the day much easier like Literally just before we started recording this podcast, I told you I just launched a Trail Runner Nation podcast. I needed a little bit of a reset. I just jumped for a few minutes downstairs in the ice bath. There was so much ice in there. I literally had to like hammer it up to like kind of make some room. Got in there for just a few minutes and you come out of it and you feel like you can conquer the world again. And so sometimes you're going through a bit of discomfort, like can can help feel you more alive too. Spot so. on, spot on. This is it. This, I mean, this is the key message. This is it. So everything would it would feel like very shallow and superficial and very easy, spot on. Yeah. And the, the, yeah. actually, if you if you get to live in Lebanon, you you will understand, because <laughs> I would like raising the bar all the time. Because they, are, I mean, the politicians are always raising raising the bar. So I'm gonna <laughs> get there faster than them. So okay, so when I raise the bar at that level, I'm gonna raise it higher. <laughs> 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 absolutely all right i want to be respectful of your time over here um what is what is some or what are some of your future um training and racing goals are there any other things that are on your list on your bucket list you'd like to accomplish i mean uh, i'm gonna aim for uh, i want to retire at a 235 marathon <laughs> uh, there nice. are two two objectives for me yeah so one one of them and uh um, I hopefully I will be able to do that running a marathon, a sub three marathon at MAF. So this is one of my objectives and I want to get there. And the other one is like running at between 235 and 240. And this is it. And I would like stop running and take it very easy from there. Uh, so th- those are my main, I mean, future projects that I'm looking forward to. I don't know if I, if I will get, when once I get there, I'm going to aim for it. Okay, so I'm going to go for the th- 230, but now I'm going to aim for that. So just to experiment and just to see how it goes. Yeah. I, I love that. So where were you at right now when you would be running at math like how far are you at distance wise um at at i mean at 35 and then i would start my cardiac drifting i would go like for i would stay like below 138 140 at the pace of 415 410 this is it (laughs) and at 35k i uh, bear in mind that i would like for that i would stay like uh, without without eating just hydrating with water i want to experiment more like adding some 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 nutrition along the way uh, I, I think it could could really help like yeah i think it would maybe. be easier for you to have less cardiac drift um and just feel more energized for longer um towards the end in particular because it's usually exactly. two and a half two and a half hours that you start seeing some of that too yeah, but 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 also uh, the thing is that uh, what what I noticed about uh, math training is that the recovery would be very uh, much faster but because th- this is this is my point. Like I can experiment with that, uh, for example, during a training uh, like a block for several times. Like I did like two or three forty two k's uh, at sub three, for example, in this month. 
in those two months, like in Jan and Feb. And each time I do that, like I just try to experiment just to see how it goes. And now I push the bar up to 35. I'm going to aim for the 38, 39, maybe to add nutrition, as as you said. Uh, and the, 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 the thing is that I can recover faster. So maybe, I don't know. We yeah. will experiment with that, and I'll keep you in the loop for sure. For sure, I think the other part would be electrolytes. That one can make a make a decent difference as well. If you're if you have a good amount of electrolytes, even the evening before, the morning of it, I would think even from a sweat rate, it would be less because the water retains more. Um, so yeah, that would be another one to to look at. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Where 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 can people find more about you? We some I know you're I'm on Strava. In Strava. Yes, Instagram mainly, and those are two. Yes, like, I, see, I see the guitar set. I, I see the guitar sessions on Strava or on not yeah. on Strava on on, uh, on, on, Instagram. on Instagram over there. Yeah, that's that's awesome, man. Yeah, that's, that's really Thank cool. You. Um, Thank you. And then. Last but not least, when are you and I going to run together? Because we have to figure out I, one of, I, probably one of the world what, majors. What, Exactly. What I realized that you're gonna run uh, with Duke in Berlin. Maybe I'm gonna plan for that. Maybe we can run together. So yeah. So, yeah, so for if, sure. if if things line up, uh, it would be Berlin this year, and then um, if if things work out, Tokyo, London, and um, New York next year, 2024. So yeah. fingers fingers crossed on that one, obviously. But um, it would be awesome to run some miles with you at one of these. So. For sure, I'm gonna I'm gonna aim for Berlin. Hope hopefully I'm, we're gonna meet there. Yeah, have <laughs> definitely. Any closing thoughts? Anything else you want to share with the audience? Uh, yeah, I mean, thank you, Flores, for being an, a real inspiration for me. I mean, it was for me uh, the breakthrough was uh, usually your video. So I I would like. Uh, uh, tell people and uh, give them this advice to watch this video. It was a really inspiration and a breakthrough for me. It was like mind shifting and life changing for me. So thank you so much for that. I'm very grateful. Uh, I'm very grateful for the PB family for because the personal best program family, because they are very supportive. I mean, we can find all the levels. We can talk and share ideas. So uh, those are th- th- those were, I mean, for me, uh, they were life-changing and what kept me going all the time. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, you you've been such a big part of like the whole extra mileage community and personal best program you you've been i I was looking back to it it's been four or five years that we've been having frequent conversations or dialogues and um, just seeing your athletic journey over the years has been super inspiring and i know that there's going to be more running improvements down the line over here it's just for you to keep the train on the rails not get injured and you you'll keep plugging away and, and getting that that running time down further yeah so. I, I mean i'm a true believer with math i will be like uh, injury free <laughs> I'm, I'm a true <laughs> believer of that <laughs> Absolutely. We sound thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I think we actually got to thank log you. off because you you and I are going to jump on the PB Zoom call, yeah. which is literally yeah. just starting in five minutes right now. So we'll uh, <laughs> we'll see you there in the, in the other Zoom okay. call. Okay. So thanks so much. Okay. All right. Thank bye you. Now. Thank you for watching. What was your favorite lesson, takeaway, or quote from this episode? Please let me know in the comments on YouTube. Also, if you would like to find out more about my running coaching program, the Personal Best Program, check out pbprogram.com. This is also the program that Wisam has been an active member of. And we have plenty of different training schedules. There's a lot of training course materials. We have an awesome community as well of like-minded athletes from around the world. So yes, check out pbprogram.com for more information over there. I appreciate you tuning in today. Have fun out there on your rounds and we'll be back in two weeks again with another episode. All right, bye now.